In this video, we go over how to set up your own mathematical model and then use technology to understand complicated real-life scenarios. Let's get started. To begin, let's remind ourselves of some formulas that we're always going to need to remember. Basic formulas like the distance between two points. For example, if you have two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2, remember that the distance between those points, d, was equal to our square root of parentheses x2 minus x1, your horizontal distance, squared, plus y2 minus y1, your vertical distance, squared, all under that square root. And it came directly from the Pythagorean theorem. Right? Another formula that we expect you to always remember is the perimeter and area formula for a rectangle. Okay? It also could work for any polygon, but we're going to focus on rectangles today. So if you have a four-sided figure, and mine's not perfectly drawn, I apologize, with four corners of 90 degrees or right angles. We call that a rectangle. It doesn't always have to have a longer side, of course. That could actually mean that a square is a rectangle. It still satisfies the requirements. But if we were interested in finding the amount of, uh, let's say, string to go around a rectangle or fencing or baseboards to cover a rectangular room, we would be talking about the perimeter. And the perimeter was add up all the sides, right? So you have a length and you have a width, L and a W. So the perimeter formula was L plus L plus W plus W. In other words, two copies of L plus two copies of W. A lot of students forget that we are adding those, not multiplying those. When do we multiply? Well, if you're trying to find the coverage, right? If you wanted to cover the area inside of that rectangular surface, that would be the area formula, which is just the base times the height, or L times W in this case. There are many, many other formulas we've seen, areas of circles, areas of all kinds of, of solid figures. But today, we're going to focus mostly on these three formulas in order to set up some more complicated modeling for real-world scenarios. So the basic idea in any type of problem that you are facing in, in real life, and especially in a math context or even a physics or science context, is to look at your problem and think of what type of quantities are you discussing. What are you trying to find? What do you already know? and then think through your toolbox, look through all the formulas you've ever studied, and come up with a mathematical model that truly does describe the situation. Once you have the model, that's the hardest part for most students, plugging in what you have to solve for what you don't have will allow you to make predictions. And finally, the most important step, perhaps, is to know whether or not your answers, your predictions that you're making, make any sense, right? You might be figuring out how many hours a day would I need to work in order to buy the new iPhone. And you do all the math based on your hourly wage, and you find out, great, I can buy the new iPhone if I make, if I, rather if I work 25 hours a day. Mm, not feasible. So we would throw out that solution and we would say that you actually can't afford to buy that iPhone. Okay? So the idea is, do your answers make sense? If they don't, it could be that your model was incorrect, but it could also mean that there is no solution to this problem. All right, so we're going to jump in to a couple of examples, and I encourage you to click on the Desmos links provided in the notes. Otherwise, you could go to desmos.com or a graphing calculator and type them in yourself. So let's get going. In example one, we have the situation where they're telling us we have a point. Technically, this should just be P. I don't know why that X is there. So we have point P, and point P is, is just a random location on the graph. So it has an X component and a Y component known as XY. If that's a point on the graph, I'll represent it, let's say, in purple. So if that's point P on the graph, OK? What we're asked to find is the distance between that point, which is changing, along the trajectory y equals x squared minus 8. Now, we've studied this type of graph. We know that this is a parabola opening up because the leading coefficient is positive and that it's been shifted down 8 units. So if we wanted to sketch this graph for ourselves, the vertex was originally at 0, 0, but now it's down at negative 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So down here is our vertex. The original three locations were negative 1, 1. So at negative 1, 1, moving it down 8, now we're at negative 1, negative 7. 0, 0 moved down 8 units to 0, negative 8. And 1, 1 moved down 8 units as well. So now it's at 1, negative 7. We could also find the x-intercepts by letting y equal 0 if we wanted to. But eventually, you'd get some graph that looks something like this, a parabola opening up after being shifted down eight units. So mine's a little rough. Hopefully yours looks nicer. But the whole point of the problem is imagining that if you were a point on this trajectory, if you're a point on this trajectory, that means you're changing locations at different points 
along the pathway, right? This might be a curve, part of some sort of, let's say, roller coaster ride. And at different locations, you are a different distance to some fixed point. So let's say, for example, that we call the point P a location here, right? At that location P, it has a certain X value and it has a certain Y value, right? And what we're saying here in the first part of the question, part A, we're asking you to find, we're asking you to find the distance between a fixed point, 0, negative 1, and a moving point, P, okay? Where would 0, negative 1 be? Well, it would be right down here, one unit below the origin. So why would we care about a problem like this in real life? Well, perhaps that's the location of a camera while you're on a roller coaster ride. And maybe the camera is set up to take a picture when you're the closest to that camera, okay? So if you're looking at your trajectory, you can probably tell where your picture is not gonna be taken if you're this point P that's moving. For example, at this location, I'm kind of not too far, but I'm definitely further than I am maybe at this location here, okay? So we're gonna be looking for the, the point where I'm closest to that physical location, that fixed point. And the way we can figure that out is by remembering the distance formula, right? The distance between any two points, we just talked about in our last slide, that the distance between any two points is found by d equals the square root of x2 minus x1 squared, so x2 minus x1 squared, plus y2 minus y1 squared, all over the square root. And that comes from the Pythagorean theorem for right triangles. So in this situation, what are my two points? <clears throat> well, you have a fixed point. Maybe you could refer to that as like your x1 and your y1. And you have a moving point. That would be point P, right? This could be like your x2 and your y2, okay? So if you want to find the distance between those two locations, the fixed and the moving point, you simply plug them into your formula. So your x2 is just the letter x. Your x1 was the number 0. Your y2 was the letter y, and your y1 was the number negative 1. But if you subtract a negative 1, you've really made addition happen. So negative negative becomes positive there. So what we really have, if we were to rewrite this formula for the situ describing this model, the situation we have, we really have that d is equal to the square root of x minus 0 is just x, so x squared plus y plus 1 squared. So what does this mean to us? Maybe it means nothing to you. Okay, what this means to someone who understands what it's saying is that if you know the x and the y coordinate of your moving point, this point P, so maybe this is at 2, 2. We don't know where it is right now, right? If you know the x and the y coordinate of that location, you immediately can have the distance between that location and the fixed point 0, negative 1. But what they've asked us to do is a little bit more intricate. They would like me to simplify the situation so that my function, my distance function, is only depending on one variable, that it's a function of just the variable x. In other words, they would like me to write this as d, which only depends on x. In other words, d parentheses x, d of x. So in order to do that, I would have to do a little more thinking. I already know that I have x in the equation, right? I had x in the equation right here, so I'm just going to copy that part. But wherever I have a y, I would like to rewrite that in terms of only x values. So I need to think about the trajectory that I'm on, p is a point on this parabolic pathway, and how x and y are related so that I could replace y with quantities containing only x's. And the good news is, I was told that if I'm truly on this trajectory, I can get my y value by saying, take your input x, square it, and subtract 8. So in other words, I can replace my y value with just that, with x squared minus 8. Let's do it. So we have y in the parentheses and then plus 1, right? And being squared. So now instead of y, I'm replacing it with what it's supposed to equal, which is x squared minus 8. I know that's kind of hard to see. Underneath that radical, it says x squared plus parentheses x squared minus 8. That replaced your y value. That's what we did right here. We placed our y value. Then I'm adding 1 and squaring it. So take a moment, pause it if you need to, write that down correctly. All right, now that we've done that, we can actually combine like terms under the radical to clean it up a little bit. So our distance formula that we're getting, that only depends on x now, is the square root of what? Well, we have x squared for sure, but then we had x squared minus 8 plus 1, 
which is really x squared minus 7. So we have x squared plus parentheses x squared minus 7 getting squared in parentheses. That's technically a function for distance which only depends on x and that's what they asked us to find. Could you write it a different way if you wanted to? Of course. If you were interested in cleaning it up further, simplifying further, you could definitely FOIL. You can multiply x squared minus 7 by itself and you'll end up getting x to the fourth power minus 14x squared plus 49 and then you have to combine it with the x squared in front to, to finally have your cleaned up expanded version. But this is sufficient. The reason this is sufficient is now if we know the input, if we know that the x location, let's say, is 1, if I'm at x equals 1, then that means I'm at this location along the trajectory, aren't I? So I could now find that distance between that location and the fixed point 0, negative 1 by simply plugging in 1 into my function, right? So without even knowing the y value, I can get that distance. That's the power of the, of the model, right? That's why we take the time to build a nice model to be able to make our predictions. So let's answer question B now. It asks you to find the distance in this model when x is 0 and when x is negative 1. So take a moment and realize that they're really just asking for d of 0 and then for d of negative 1. So feel free to pause the video and plug those inputs into your new function to see what your distance would be. Let's see how you did. When you plugged in 0 into your new model here, the x value 0 cancels out. It's just 0, right? It wipes away. So all that's left, really, is what's in parentheses here. That would be negative 7 after 0 gets squared. It's just negative 7 getting squared. Well, that's a positive 49. So in reality, you just have the square root of 49 or 7. So what we're claiming is that at the input 0, at that point on the trajectory, we are 7 units from the fixed point 0, negative 1. That kind of makes sense here. At 0, you would be down here, wouldn't you? That is exactly 7 units away from that location because that y value is negative 8 and this y value was negative 1. They're 7 units apart. So that's probably not the location where we're going to be when we take our picture, right? We want to be closest to the camera when we take that picture. What about at negative 1? So that would be over here, right? Well, that's somewhere down here. It's a little bit closer, right? Let's see what it would be. Well, you'd get the square root of something. And what happens when you plug in negative 1? Again, feel free to pause the video and then see how you did. When you plugged in negative 1, you would have gotten negative 1 squared here, which is just positive 1. Then here you would have, so I'll write positive 1 for you. Here you would have, again, positive 1 minus 7, which is negative 6. But if you square a negative 6, you really have a positive 36. In other words, when you add those up, you get the square root of 37. So I'm going to erase that for a moment. Square root of 37 would be our distance. So what is that saying? Well, you could put this in your calculator, but I know, without even using a calculator, maybe you do too, that the square root of 37 is a little bigger than the square root of 36. So this is definitely a little bit bigger than 6. You could go in your calculator and get the exact, uh, not the exact, but the approximate decimal where that would be. But it's a little bit more than 6 away. Still closer than 7, right? But it's a little bit more than 6 away. All right. So we've practiced now the importance of finding the model so that we can have individual distances. At this location, this is how far I am. At this location, this is how far I am from the fixed point. But the question that we're really interested in ultimately is, when will I be at the closest point when I can take my picture on the roller coaster, right? So the idea here is I would like to minimize my distance. Now, if you remember, we've been studying a lot of graphs so far. When we had parabolas, for example, like the one we have here, we might have a local minimum, right? Or if we had a parabola opening down, we might have a local maximum. Similarly, anytime we have a type of curve, there could be potential for mins and maxes. So what we're going to depend on in this section is using technology to input our model into and then see where we have our mins or our maxes. So let's do just that. We're going to actually switch gears right now. We're going to switch over to our uh, graphing software, desmos.com. So you could click on the link in your notes or you could type it in yourself. D of x equals the square root of x squared plus x squared minus 7 in parentheses squared. So feel free to pause the video. Make sure that you have that formula written down before we proceed to find our answer. Because the question is, after sketching that graph, D of x, find the values that would minimize that distance. We're expecting them to be somewhere around here, right? Somewhere around here. But let's see if we can find out exactly where those are. So let's switch gears here. So here we have our situation. 
right? We had our parabola, which was opening up. We had our fixed point at zero, negative one. And so what we're saying here is, what would be the minimum distance from our fixed point to a point that's moving along the trajectory? So if we notice here that I've typed in on the top left side here, I've typed in d of x equals our model, x squared plus x squared minus seven in parentheses squared all under the square root. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what that looks like. See if I can get it to show there. Okay, it's kind of interesting. So if I move it up a little bit, you can see it better. You have this interesting blue kind of symmetrical curve. It looks like it has nice symmetry, some y-axis symmetry. Notice it actually does have a local minimum here at negative 2.55 roughly, and that local minimum is the y value 2.598, but also at approximately x equals 2.55, the y value is still 2.598. We also have a local max at 0, 0.7, so that's when we'd be furthest away. That's the max distance away from our fixed point. So that makes sense if I zoom out a bit. We can see that at that location, 0, 0.7, 7 units away, that's gonna be our maximum distance. But at this location, negative 2.55, if we go on our graph here and find about negative 2.55, let's see if I can get close to it. Closer, closer, I'm pretty close. That's about where we're gonna be the closest to that camera, right? So the question was, at what x value would our distance be minimized? And the answer according to the technology would be negative 2.545, or on the positive side of things, this minimum was positive 2.555. So also on this side, about 2.5. Five, five, roughly. Okay, so let's head back over to our um, slide and we can fill in our question now. Okay, so now we know that the value which should be minimizing our distance based on the graph that we got that looked something like this, we went and found our minimums and they occurred at the x value negative 2.55 roughly and positive 2.55. Those were the x values when we got those minimums. Okay, so those would be our answers. When x equals negative 2.55 or positive 2.55, that would be when we expect to be closest, that's min the minimal distance is the closest to that fixed point. So we had to use our model, then technology, to find the min and the max. You might be thinking, am I always gonna have to use technology? The good news is if you go on to take calculus, you'll be able to find those extreme values on your own without technology. But right now we're having to be dependent on, on technology. Okay, let's head over to our last example of this section. It says that we have a rectangle which has been inscribed into a semicircle. The semicircle has a radius of two units, and then they've even gone so far as to give you the equation for that semicircle. Y equals the square root of four minus x squared and they've shown you the graph below. If you're wondering why that's the equation of the semicircle, remember that if you had a circle, a full circle, you could describe this equation in standard form as x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals your radius r squared, where h k was your center. So if this is our situation where it's centered at the origin, we would have x squared plus y squared because h k is zero, zero, and the radius two, two squared would be four, wouldn't it? But if we were to solve for y so that we could get y by itself, this would have been y squared equals four minus x squared. Now you might see what's gonna happen next. Technically to get y by itself, you would have to undo the exponent of two, so you would have to take the square root, but not just the positive, also the negative version. So what is happening here is that we had a circle, an entire full circle, that in order to show the circle as a function, we had to set it up using two different functions. We had the positive semicircle and we had the negative semicircle. So the positive would show you that piece and the negative would show you the bottom half, okay? So since they're wanting to only show us the top half, that's why in the formula above, we just have the positive square root of four minus x squared. And if you're going on in math, that's gonna be a pretty common way of recognizing a semicircle that we had a square root of a number minus x squared equaling y. Okay, so I wanted to go through that real fast with you. Oops, let's go ahead and clean that up. And now let's jump into the rest of our problem. So they have graphed it for us. They've told us the equation, which is very nice. We're gonna need to probably use that equation, most likely. And now they'd like us to let p, again, p should just be a point p, and that point p is known as x, y. It's a point on the circular pathway, the semicircular pathway. But notice they want it to be only in quadrant one. So we could pick any point in quadrant one. Maybe it's up here, we're not sure yet where it is. 
but it's going to have an x location and a y location because this is quadrant one. Remember, it goes around counterclockwise, one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's a point in quadrant one. Awesome. They say that that point is also a vertex, which is a corner of the rectangle. What rectangle again? A rectangle inscribed inside of your semicircle. What that would mean if it's inscribed inside of the semicircle is that what's going on is that you've drawn the rectangle so that the vertices are on the actual semicircle and that the base is on the x-axis in this case. So for example, starting at the x-axis, we'd go up to that point, wouldn't we? And then we would just go straight over. We get another vertex and straight down. Mine looks kind of squarish, okay? But depending on where you put that point, you get a different type of rectangle, don't you? This one's kind of tall. Notice if I had put P maybe in this corner instead, we would have had a much um, lower and longer rectangle. So depending where you put P, you get a different uh, shape of your rectangle. It's, it's still going to be a rectangle, but it has a different length and a different width. So with that in mind, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be answering some questions about area and perimeter. Okay, so let's think about what they're asking us here. They say in part A here, express the area of this rectangle as a function of x. Well, if we're thinking area, we're thinking coverage, right? That's what area usually refers to. So area equals what formula again for a rectangle? That's right. You have a length times a width. So now we're going to have to think this through, how we could describe our length and our width based on the information that has been provided. Well, this is where you have to do a little bit of thinking again. We know that if we have a point P here with an X and a Y location, if you start out at the origin to get to that point, you would have gone X units to the right, and you would have gone Y units up. So if you go X units right and Y units up, that's how you get to the location for P, which is X comma Y. But that's actually helpful for interpreting the situation as far as length and width are concerned. Because if we were to think of length as our horizontal and width as our vertical, we would say that width would be y in this case, right? So width is y. But length would not be x, would it? Because the rectangle doesn't just stop and start at, in the first quadrant, right? It goes into quadrant 2 as well. So the rectangle is actually going to have a length not just of x, but of, what is it? That's right, 2x because of symmetry. So x plus x, if you want to write it out slowly, or just 2x. So if you recognize the width is your y and the length is your 2x, you can now plug into your formula for area. Now area would be equaling the length, which is 2x, times the width, which is y. Now you might be thinking, based on what we did a moment ago, what's going to come next, right? The next thing we'd have to do is write it as a function of only one variable, only x. So if we wanted to write this in terms of just one variable, only x, what would happen? Well, we would need to write y in terms of x. And if we're truly a point on the rectangle as a vertex and also on the semicircular pathway, then we could follow the equation of the semicircular pathway, which says that to find y, we take the square root of 4 minus x squared up here, which would mean that we could replace y with that value. So let's do that. We would now say area will only depend on x, and it will equal 2x, that was already there, times y, where y is the square root of 4 minus x to the second power. OK, so we have our interesting area model here. So what is this saying? Let's interpret it, right? It's saying that if you know x, which is in this situation, this distance here, it's basically half of your length, right? If you know x, the x-coordinate of your point, then you can know the entire area that you expect to cover with your rectangle. So depending on your x, if your x is up here, you're going to get a different area. If your x is down here, you're going to get a different area that you cover. So let's see if we could answer the question below based on that information. So the question below says, use technology, which we're going to use our Desmos link that I provided, or you can type it into a graphing calculator yourself if you prefer. And we're going to sketch this model that we've just seen here. Okay? And so what happens if we sketch it? I'm going to tell you the answers first, and then we'll go to the model and look at it ourselves. This one turns out to look like, let me make sure I'm looking at the right one here. Doo, 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 doo. Yes, this one should turn out for area to look something like this. When we look at our model, it'll be something like this. 
and it will have extrema min, min and max at these locations and we're looking for the value which maximizes area so we're going to be looking for the one at the top there which should be when x is roughly 1.414 or 1.41 roughly so the answer here will, will be when x is roughly 1.414 and again i'll go show you the pictures at the end but i don't want to lose my writing just yet okay finally they are now interested in knowing so we just talked about when that's going to happen. 1.414, by the way, wouldn't quite be the way I've drawn it, right? It actually would have been around here, right? At this location, that's around one and a half. So that's where we actually want to put our point to get that kind of area, the maximum area. Okay, so now to answer our second question about perimeter. If we're talking about perimeter, let me erase my area here. Let's see if I can do that carefully. Okay, if you're talking about perimeter, <clears throat> then what you're really interested in is how much it would take to cover the size of the rectangle, right? The perimeter of that rectangle. That would be what I'm talking about. And we remember that for perimeter of a rectangle, our formula is two copies of the length plus two copies of the width. So with that in mind, we could then say, okay, we know the length is 2x based on what we discussed earlier. So we'd say two times, let me rewrite that. Okay, we're gonna say perimeter would be 2 times my length, where my length was, that's right, 2x, plus 2 times my width, where my width was y. But you might see where we're going to go again. We want it only as a function of x. So what did we do last time to get it only as a function of x? That's right, we replaced y with what it should equal if you're truly on the semicircular pathway. So now p of x, p depends only on x, perimeter depends only on the x-coordinate of point p. And it would be 2 times 2x, which is 4x, plus 2 times y, where y was, according to our model above, the square root of 4 minus x squared. So this is our model that we would then use in technology in order to answer questions about minimizing or maximizing our perimeter. And that's what we are asked to do in our last part here. In part D, we are asked to use the technology to sketch the perimeter model that we just got here to find the x value which maximizes our perimeter. And in this case, we're going to look at our graph together in a moment, we should be getting a situation of a curve like this, which will indicate to us that we'll have our maximum somewhere up here, which will be around 1.789 according to technology. So now we'll know when we will have our perimeter maximized, when x is approximately 1.789 units. So what does that mean? Well, last time we said at around one and a half, that's where we would want to draw our vertex here, P, and draw our rectangle. This time we're saying we would go even further. We would go to 1.8 roughly, and that's where we would draw our rectangle vertex there. And it would be very, very long, so we'd use that more perimeter that way. Okay, so let's go ahead and check technology now so you can see that I didn't make this up. Let me clear my screen here. Yep, here. Okay, let's head over here. Let me get to our graph for this problem. Here we go. So this was our semicircular pathway. For our area model, we ended up getting that funky curve that had nice origin symmetry. And look, in fact, that the max was when x was 1.414. And the 4 that you're seeing as your y-coordinate, that would be for area, right? That would be the maximum area we expect, 4 square units at that location. On the other hand, when we typed in our perimeter model, we got a really funky graph. It didn't even look like a curve at first. But if we zoom out, oh, there's the curve. And we can see it does have a relative maximum when x is 1.789. This was our perimeter equation, which means that if you make your x coordinate of that moving point p around 1.789, you can expect to use up the maximum amount of perimeter to go around that rectangle. And it would be 8.944 roughly units to go around it. Okay, so now we have talked about how to set up a model. We've talked about how to interpret the model. And now it's up to you to remember all these steps, put them all together, and not give up, all right? I hope to see you next time. Remember, math is not a spectator sport. Good luck.